Okay, class, in this section, we're going to talk just briefly about some mechanics regarding the flow of blood through the heart and ventricular contraction uh, as we head into more specifics about the relationship between pressure and volume. So just remembering again, the majority of filling in the heart is passive, right? It's a key thing to remember as we start getting into isovolumetric contraction and all these, how these things kind of work. So again, blood enters into the heart through the vena cava, right? We have our inferior and superior vena cava, which returns blood. I don't like to use the word deoxygenated because there is technically some oxygen in that blood. It's just a lower amount. So low oxygen blood returns into the right side of the heart, often referred to as the pulmonic circuit enters in through the atria. Again, it's going to passively fill. It's going to cross and enter into the ventricle. Again, the atria and the ventricles fill simultaneously. It's going to fill, right? We'll have our action potential. It'll cause the atria to contract. We're going to kick that last little bit of blood into the ventricles. The right AV valve will just be snapped shut to prevent outflow from the ventricles into the atria. The chorda tendon A keep them intact. As the right ventricle contracts and contracts and contracts in that closed chamber, sealed off by the AV node and the AV valve, the pressure will rise higher than the pulmonary artery pressure, again, the downstream pressure, the pulmonary artery valve will open, blood will go into the pulmonary artery, into the lungs, be perfused through the capillary system within the lungs and alveoli. They'll return back through the pulmonary veins. Now you may be wondering, how are we returning or carrying blood that is high oxygenated, right? You know, these pulmonary veins, but we're calling them veins, right? Don't veins carry deoxygenated or low oxygen blood? Well, the term vein really just means a vessel that returns blood back to the heart. That's the easiest way to remember it because the peripheral veins and the pulmonary veins do the same thing, right? It's just that the peripheral veins, like our, you know, the ones we see all throughout our muscles and our body, right? They're all just bringing blood back to the heart. The same properties here for the pulmonary veins, they're bringing blood from the lungs that have been oxygenated back to the left side of the heart. I know it's a little bit of a tricky term, but that's what a vein means. An artery, right, means something that is leaving the heart, right? So that's why we've got, um, you know, the, the we've got our pulmonary artery, which is deoxygenated, right? But it's pumping, you know, it's, the blood is moving away from the heart. Right, so pulmonary artery, even though it's low oxygenated, and we think arteries and arterioles typically is something that contains high oxygen, it's just really a vessel that's bringing blood away from the heart. So veins return, arteries, you know, blood's moving away from the heart. So just a little terminology here. But anyway, so once blood, you know, leaves the lungs, they enter into the pulmonary veins, right and left. They both attached to the left atria, there's four of them. They fill and dump blood into the atria, through the atria, past the left AV valve, also known as the mitral valve, right? And we're passively filling again into the ventricles and the atria simultaneously. Once, you know, we had that depolarization, that left atria contracts, kicks that late, that 20% into the left ventricle, pumps out into the aorta, um, and then it perfuses the rest of the body, um, including the heart itself. Through the, you know, and we'll talk about that later on. But again, that's the general flow of blood in and out of the heart. Now, the key thing to remember: we kind of track things from you know the right all the way through the left. Remember that these both sides are pumping simultaneously. The heart's a double pump. The right side and left side are both contracting, right? And they occur almost simultaneously, as we described through the conduction system, through those bundle branches and all the way different things split. 
Okay, so just remember these events are occurring simultaneously to create coordinated pumping. Now, an important thing to remember when the heart contracts, it rotates and rings, right? Um, it twists, right? And actually, when we look at the motion of the heart, we're looking for that kind of ringing out motion, this twisting motion. You can think almost like the subepicardium, the, the stuff that's like right at the most superficial layer, kind of twists over um, the uh, the uh, subendocardium to, to create this kind of ringing out effect, like you're taking a sponge and twisting to get you know everything out. That's basically how the ventricles contract; they kind of twist and rotate. Okay, when they relax, they unwind and almost creates kind of a vacuum effect. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, creating a negative pressure, which actually helps draw blood in. Right. in early diastole. Right. By that uncoupling or that unwinding. Right. Creates that vacuum, that suction effect and helps draw blood back in. So it's kind of cool to see how intricately um, designed our heart is for very efficient and effective pumping. And even the subtle motions, right, are really important too. When you look at cardiologists, when you look at their reports from an echocardiogram, which looks at the pumping and structure of the heart, they'll often look at the motion and how well these things are coordinated. It's kind of, kind of neat. And then another thing to remember too, is the, the, the load um, and force velocity relationship. So at any given velocity of shortening, the muscle exerts greater tension if we stretch it with a greater preload. That's true for cardiac muscle. We'll cover that concept later on. Um, and at any given afterload, right, so if we um, add resistance, right, the velocity of shortening is greater if we stretch the muscle with a greater preload. Basically, it's saying that it's the same concept as other muscles. If we contract at a slower speed, we'll have greater force. Um, and any, you know, amount of pre-stretch prior, it's going to allow for the heart to pump more effectively. And this get, makes, makes more sense. Later on, we start talking about preload and afterload and how these things kind of work. But again, similar prompt principles here in, in the cardiac muscle as we see in the peripheral muscle. The next thing we'll kind of dive into is Wigger's diagram. And this will make sense. We're going to cover it, cover this here before we get into pressure volume loops, because if you understand this, it'll make everything a lot more simpler. So again, we've got a few different plots um, on this on this diagram. OK, so we've got on the bottom, the ECG, electrocardiogram. Phonocardiograms, don't worry too much about that. Let's start looking at the, the sounds that are produced. That'll make more sense when we start talking about cardiac auscultation. So it really wouldn't worry too much about that. The sound of valves closing either way. Don't, don't worry about too much about that. But let's focus on the electrocardiogram, the ventricular volume curve, ventricular pressures, and then the aortic and um, atrial pressures, OK? so. Again, electrical events dictate mechanical events. They precede them, OK? So here we have our P wave, which corresponds to atrial contraction. We have our QRS complex, which corresponds to ventricular contraction. And our T wave, which represents repolarization. So we said P, R, you know, QRS complex, T wave, OK? That's all I want you to know for this. We'll, we'll touch more about ECGs later on. So as uh, before we begin atrial, you know, depolarization, right? Here's our ventricular volume, right? Looking at this here, right? Again, so bear bear that in mind. As the atria contract, right? We see a little bit of an uptick in ventricular volume. That's that atrial kick, right? Volume increases a little bit, okay? As we have the QRS complex, which is ventricular depolarization, right? That corresponds to then ventricular contraction. So we've got contraction and then we see volume suddenly, right, decrease here, okay? We have, again, a little bit of leveling off in between that. That's what we call isovolumetric contraction. You're like, what is that little like dip? Why is that plateaued right after the QRS? Again, like we mentioned, we contract and we build pressure until we have ejection, right? So again, let's go back over that. We have, you know, our baseline volume. We have atrial contraction. We kick a little bit of extra blood into 
um, or, or so it goes n n diastolic volume. We have the contraction of the atria, which adds that last little bit of volume into the ventricles. We have the QRS complex, right, which corresponds to depolarization of the ventricles. They begin to contract. Systole begins, but there's isovolumetric contraction, right? There's no change in volume here. It's a little period, but that's when we're squeezing and squeezing in the ventricles. The AV valves are closed, but the semilunar valves, the aortic and pulmonic valves are still closed as well. Pressure is building while volume is staying the same. It's called isovolumetric contraction. We eventually build enough pressure in the chamber to allow ejection of blood, the volume reduces, right? As we pump, 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 pump blood, okay? We get to isovolumetric uh, relaxation, where again, where the heart's beginning to relax, the aortic valve closes, the AV valves will eventually open, but there's a period of delay before they kind of suction back open as the heart unwinds, and then we return to passive filling, right? And that as the AV valves kind of suction back open from that unringing, we get that inf rapid inflow and then you know, passive filling as we return back to you know, that cycle again. So again, that's the volume plot. The pressure plot follows the same kind of thing. So again, looking at our, our corresponding P waves, the big things that kind of bear in mind, again, the AV valves calls cl are closed right before isovolumetric contraction, right? Pressure begins to increase during that rapidly, right? Because the AV valves are closed and we're contracting. We've kicked in that little bit of atrial kick prior to that. We're contracting, contracting, building pressure, building pressure to, to the point where the aortic valve eventually opens. We're still contracting, still contracting during ejection. Blood's leaving the heart. Right. And eventually it begins to drop off as we you know, pump the remaining blood. Volume drops off rapidly. The heart begins to unwind. The AV valves open and then we re have restart the, the, the passive filling of the heart. That is basically the pressure volume curve in a nutshell, broken down step by step. It's a lot easier if you remember these events by looking at Wigger's diagram before we get into the, the pressure volume curves. And again, there's a good little graph here to remember here. It just goes over the same exact events looking at, and it, it, this might help too, because you see the different things bolded in red that are contracting. And just another example of that too. Again, corresponding to different events in the ECG, um, you know, of what happens prior to that mechanical event. Um, so there's a nice little video here um, that I recommend checking out that just kind of shows what the heart looks like when it contracts. Again, it kind of it's, it, it, it rings and twists as it contracts and unwinds as it relaxes. You can also think of it as like your hand, right, kind of pumping, right? It's a way to kind of think about it. And we'll go over that maybe in our, in our live lecture. Um, so that is, again, the basic mechanics of cardiac pumping. We'll go over in the next section uh, cardiac output and then factors that influence cardiac output before we start moving into the pressure volume curve. So I just want to introduce that concept here before we get into that. And uh, that's all I have for this section.